All right, great. Well, today uh, I'm here with Duncan Clark, who is uh, head of Europe at Canva. Uh, here to talk about some insights on uh, going global and internationalization as well as localization. Um, Canva is a just uh, an incredible company, a very amazing you know company. Uh, founded in Sydney uh, a little over a, a decade ago, uh, it's truly a global company. Uh, I think. Uh, they just recently announced something like 220 million monthly active users across 195 com uh, countries, which is, I think, almost all the countries. Um, I think maybe they're 230 or so in the world. Uh, one in five internet users per month use Canva, which I thought was a pretty astounding uh, stat. And uh, also recently announced uh, some, some revenue numbers. It's uh, two and a half billion of revenue, and at that scale, it's still growing at 44% year on year. And is profitable. So, uh, you know, you, as an investor, I mean, we don't really see companies of this scale that are rule of 40 or better. Um, you know, at, at uh, continuing to grow. Uh, last valued or uh, currently valued a little bit more than 30 billion. It's one of the most most uh, highly anticipated IPO candidates for hopefully 2025. Because I think we all we all could really use some great IPOs in 2025, um, and or, or perhaps a little later. So uh, I'm here with Duncan, uh, who's head of Europe. So maybe just to start, I, I guess you were. Um, you were a founder yourself of a company that was actually acquired by Canva uh, uh, about three, four years ago. So what was the story there? Yeah, that's right. So last time I was at Slush, it was when we were raising our seed round for, for Flourish. So Flourish is a very widely used tool for visualizing data. Um, so if you see a chart on a website, especially on a news site or a professional services site or a finance site, it's very often made with, with Flourish. And um, so we were very much kind of trying to, we set out to try and own data storytelling online. Um, and that was going very well. We'd grown, we had very high visibility because we were on most of the world's major news websites. Um, so we had quite a good brand presence even though we were quite small. Um, and so Canva reached out to us and there was a very natural alignment because Canva set out to empower the world to design. That means owning all types of visual communication. Mm -hmm. And visual communication with data is quite a particular specialist thing. Um, and it was a really sweet fit because we had been thinking about turning Flourish into more of a presentation tool to grow the addressable market. Canva really built the best online presentation tool. And so it was a, it was a sort of very natural marriage. That's great. Um, and so at that point where you were debating between you know, raising around a Series A or, or you know, pursuing the, you know, the, the merger or the acquisition, um, what went through your head? I mean, you know, you, I mean we often talk about how uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to see more you know, companies stay independent here you know, in Europe, but you've obviously now as part of Canva have created a, a much like a, a very large you know, team and presence in, in Europe. So how did you, you and your co-founder make that decision to you know, sell versus to continue on? Well, it was a really easy decision, actually. We, we'd, been, we'd been approached by several companies who were keen to acquire us, and we'd, we'd had some detailed conversations with them. But we ultimately found ourselves just feeling not very excited by those conversations, not very excited by the future. We looked at the independent future and the future with them, and we thought, sure, it's fine, but actually, this is more exciting. Yeah. And so we just followed where we thought the excitement was. Um, when we ch chatted to Canva, when we were in the middle of a Series A round, um, it was completely different. We immediately felt the excitement ramp up. Um, and that's partly because, as you described in your introduction, Canva is a, it's a kind of once-in-a-generation type company to be growing that fast at that scale, but also to still have the mindset and culture of a startup, very much a founder-led startup. Um, so it just felt like we were attaching ourselves to something bigger and more exciting rather than opting for like a balance of risk and reward, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite an easy decision. And another factor for, well, there are two other major factors for me. One is that Canva, not everyone knows this, but it is public information that Canva, about 30% of the equity in Canva has been pledged to good causes. So that was a big draw for me. This was a kind of, a thing that was almost unique in the in the startups. It is it is amazing. I mean, when you told me this, I was uh, I was you know shocked in a really positive way because you know we hear about pledge one percent, but they're pledging thirty percent of the cap table. I mean, that's 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 outstanding. Um, it, so that was a big part of the you know that kind of drives the culture that you know kind of attracted you. So that was a huge thing, just in terms of adding value to the world. Um, and then the other thing was there was just this very exciting opportunity because Canvas HQ in Sydney, so it had almost no team in Europe. 
Um, and of course, Europe is one of the biggest concentrations of knowledge workers in the world, uh, one of the biggest markets for Canva potentially. Um, tens of millions of active users there every month, but almost no team. And so we both, on both sides, saw this opportunity to take the acquisitions that have been made in Europe, including Flourish in London, and to grow a significant European operation. So we went from, there was no entity, no staff in the UK when, when we required. We're now a couple of, uh, 250 people in the UK, 400 in Europe, um, and we've made several acquisitions um, across the continent. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, uh, so, so tell me, you know, as head of Europe, what does that mean? You know, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What, is the, what does the job entail? So it's, it's a mixture of lots of different things. I mean, if you think of what an exec does in a company generally, or what a founder does, it's a lot about trying to make sure that all the different bits are working well together. Mm. And if you have a company where you have a team that's a long way from the HQ and the time zones are really bad, then marketing inevitably ends up being a bit separate from sales, a bit separate from product and engineering. Um, so it's partly about just making sure that everyone is sort of singing from the same hymn sheet and kind of enabling and empowering each other. Mm -hmm. But it's also making sure that our acquisitions are doing well in themselves, but also aligning strategically with the company. Um, so we acquired Affinity recently in, in, in Nottingham. It's the world's best, fastest um, professional design suite. And so we're working really, really closely with them, both to help them grow as a, as a standalone brand, but also to work out what the future looks like um, as we work more and more closely together. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I guess you, you, know, you mentioned, so the, the company headquartered in Sydney, uh, you know, it's, it's really rare to see a company you know, of this scale, especially you know, one that's outside of the Bay Area, just uh, really disrupt such a large category. Uh, and we talked a bit about you know, the scale and kind of the, the massive, amount of, a massive amount of usage that you have. But uh, I'm kind of curious, like, how, how did Canva do this? So, you know, you're covering 195 countries, uh, you know, you're here in Europe. How do you decide you know, um, what resources kind of uh, you know, headcount wise, team wise to localize, what to keep uh, centralized? I mean, how do, you, how do you think about those decisions, especially with such a massive uh, global footprint? Well, I think it depends. Different companies are in different spaces and at different stages that the, the prioritization looks a bit different. But I think if you are in a product-led company rather than an enterprise sales-led company, as Canva was in the early days, um, then it's a lot about thinking globally. And I actually think the fact that Canva has been so unbelievably successful relates to the fact that they were in Australia rather than the Bay Area. because. Mm -hmm. Um, fairly early on in the journey, they had this very global outlook, which was, we need to get this application translated into dozens of languages. And of course, what that led to, they did that way earlier than most American companies would do it, because they just had this more global lens. And what that led to is a much more global bottoms-up adoption um, and of course, you know, that doesn't necessarily work in every country in the world. What you sometimes find is some countries, there might be a natural fit for whatever combination of, um, you know, the culture, the competitive landscape, the, the, the particular needs of those users. And you can have a thing where those countries run away successfully and then you can almost like reinforce that and yeah. pr over prioritize those countries and forget some other ones. We're, I'm curious on that. I mean, were there any countries that sort of surprised you, you know, that, that you know, kind of you didn't expect would be, you know, so successful in terms of their you know, level of adoption or scale or revenue? Well, I'd say, I mean, just to mention a few different countries and every country has its own different dynamics. Um, for example, in the case of uh, Brazil, uh, that's a, a country where Canva hit a really good note really early on, mm -hmm. a lot of um, self-reinforcement and um, so it's a huge, huge user base over there. But to give a completely different example, the Philippines, um, and it's the Philippines where we're about to, you know, we're getting close to one in five internet users yeah. globally. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the Philippines, that's where we opened a big office, which was originally focused on customer support. It became also like a design hub for making mm. templates and things. We've now got 1,000 people in Manila. And one of the things that happened in the Philippines is it became our most penetrated market, but we didn't actually lean in with marketing spend. It's mm. just that the team did such an incredible job of being advocates on the ground there. Um, so 
two completely different examples. And then if you look at, say, uh, Europe, we've got very highly penetrated markets in France and Spain, um, but they also have you know, really big education communities using it. And in Canva, we have 70 million free education users every month. So students, teachers. Um, you look at a market like Germany, for example, and the dynamics are just quite different in terms of how people engage with software. People are much more reluctant to use a free tool. They tend to either, they want to try it out, decide whether they like it, and if they do, they want to pay. So the, 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 the conversion metrics look different in every country. The, the use cases look different. Um, and of course, what that means from a localization perspective and a marketing perspective is you need to be really clear in each market about what you're trying to achieve. Because if you describe that globally, it's just yeah. not, not going to land. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that you know, the conversion rates differ by market. I was involved in years ago in a, in a, a, a successful freemium you know, business model that was very global. And uh, they had a model where uh, it was free to use, but if you wanted to use it commercially, they would ask on the honor system that you, you pay a license fee. And they found that certain markets, like in Germany, Everybody paid, you know, like they were, if they were using it commercially, people paid. And in, in, in a number of other markets, and I won't mention the specific ones, very few people paid. And it was just such a challenge to sort of figure out, like, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that, right? And, and had, you know, just sort of these, these kind of different, I call them business norms, I suppose. So. Completely. And, and there's the business norms, and then there's the kind of just the cultural norms. I mean, we recently launched a big creative campaign in the U.S., called Love Your Work, and this had a lot of American people in the workplace using Canva, loving it, um, impressing their colleagues, and then high-fiving, and generally being American-style upbeat. And um, of course, you know, the UK and the US, they're both English-speaking markets, so there's lots of overlap, lots in common. But we took that creative and tested it with a, with a UK audience, and of course, as any Brit Looking yeah. at it in advance could have could have said um, it just didn't work at all. Did not resonate. It had almost the opposite um, success scores relative to the U.S. audience. So that's a good example of another important part of localization, which is thinking about how you you put your brand across and how you protect the kind of the core aspects of the brand and make yeah. that unified. But potentially, as we did in this case, actually completely been a campaign that was in one market and do something completely fresh um, that works way better for a local market. Yeah. And, and I, you know, from what I've gathered, you know, Canva also has had you know, a, a lot of success in the U.S. in particular. Um, I mean, you know, many of these markets around the world, but um, I guess as you talk about you know, marketing and different tactics, you know, one of the things I've seen across many of our companies that have a similar uh, kind of you know, either prosumer or SMB, you know, mixed with enterprise kind of model is, from a marketing standpoint, there's often this sort of trade-off they have to face at some point where their, you know, the, the unit economics, the CAC to LTV might be really attractive in some of these more emergent markets, but they're, they're smaller markets. Uh, and then they look at the US, and the LTV to CAC is a lot less attractive because it's just such, you know, it's, it's a much bigger market, but it's a lot more competitive. And there's often this question of like, well, you know, where should we allocate our dollars? You know, should we try to just grow as efficiently as possible uh, in these more emerging markets, or should we go after the big, you know, the big prize, you know, which is which is the U.S.? Um, how do you, how does Canva, you know, think about you know that question? Um, well, it's a it's a it's a great question, and I think one of the things that we do is we try and take a really holistic view of what localization is. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the question of where you put your marketing budget is, is just one part of it. And, and as you say, there's, all, there's always a sort of trade-off and a set of prioritizations there, um, which are probably quite company and country specific. But to sort of, do, if you zoom out a bit and you say, it's not actually just about where you spend your marketing budget. Like at Canva, we have a kind of pillar across the company, which we call truly local. And truly local cuts across marketing, product, content, um, and growth and, and all the other bits of the business to recognize that to really succeed in a country, it's not just about whether you're putting more marketing budget there. It's about, I mean, if I gave you a list, it would include things like local partnerships. It would, it would entail pricing and packaging. Mm -hmm. for, for, for Canva, which has a lot of content in it, you know, here we are in Helsinki. If you come in and you want to make a presentation about something, you search for the word breakfast in our element library, the photos you want to serve up, you know, are going to look different in 
I couldn't get a croissant this morning. So I guess, you know, you wouldn't want croissants like in France. Yeah, the Helsinki um, breakfast look very different very, from, exactly. from New York. Yeah. And, um, and so it's the relevance of the content. Um, and, but they're, they're wonderful, by the way. But yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just to be clear. Yeah. But the, uh, it's also about SEO. Like what kind of, not, not just are you translating your landing pages, but are you, do you even have landing pages for the right things? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. when you line all of that up, um, you realize that international growth is about so much more than just deciding where you're going to allocate your budget. It's actually about how you organize your entire company mm -hmm. around everything from what local payment systems you provide to what region-specific SEO pages you're going to make. Yeah. Payments in particular seems like a real you know, challenge I hear about from a lot of companies. I mean, I'm just curious, I mean, based on what you see, is there, you know, how much of a headache has that been? And uh, you know, is, do you think there's still white space for startups in those areas to sort of address payments problems in different, uh, different geographies? Or? Well, it's just, again, it's very, very global. You know, we have an amazing team in China doing a lot of growth work there. And of course, the payment systems used there are super, super different. Um, I was chatting recently to some of the team about growth in Africa. And there are parts of Africa where um, the majority of SaaS spend still goes through uh, scratch cards bought at the local shop yeah. because people are very, very reluctant to put their credit card details into any website. And it takes a long time of having them as a customer before they trust you enough to actually give you their card details. Mm. So it's very, very different dynamics. You know, Mexico looks very different from the US, for example. Um, it's probably a little bit less of a thing in, in Europe, but it's, um, it's certainly it's a big sort of thing. Sort elsewhere, globally. yeah. Um, you know, it's also striking that, um, you know, sort of the breadth of the kind of user personas you serve is so, is so broad. I, you know, I, when my, I have a 13-year-old daughter, I think I mentioned when I, you know, told her that I was doing this session, you know, she said, like, Canva, dad, like, I, you know, it's, I love Canva. It's like, it's my favorite, you know, she uses it a ton for school. And it just really struck me that you've got, you know, everything from, as you mentioned, you know, I think 70 million, you know, folks in the education, you know, you know students and so forth that are using it, uh, maybe for free, as well as prosumers and SMBs and, and, and enterprise. And from what I gathered, you know, the, the transition to enterprise happened pretty late in the in the company's evolution and we we often get questions from our portfolio companies when they're 10 50 100 you know million of revenue about you know when should they go and start you know pursuing uh, enterprise um, you know but here it was you know I think Canva had a billion and a half of revenue or something like that maybe you know before they did it so how is that if, if at all like changed the company changed the staffing changed the approach to a go to market so I mean a big part of internationalization is sales and once you're dealing with um Enterprises, of course, boots on the ground, local relationships become really, really important. I mean, in the case of Canva, it's always been a product-led, bottom-up company. And then we've added sort of top-down sales um, on top of that, but it still draws on that same base. And so although we only really said, we are now an enterprise company, mm -hmm. um, we launched a whole suite of enterprise uh, products earlier this year, and a lot of the stuff that you just, the enabling things you need, like really good security, really good SSO, all that stuff, Although that's quite recent, in terms of where people have been using Canva, it, it, we've been in enterprises pretty well from the For beginning. For a long time, okay. I mean, I, um, you know, we recently looked up all the domains of a, of a big agency group that we're having a conversation with. We found that there were 25,000 Canva registrations on those email domains. <laughs> and not all of those were still at the company, not all of them were active. It's pretty wild though, But yeah, it's yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. And so what, you know, the, the Canva approach to Enterprise is to a significant degree about enabling companies to recognize and consolidate all the usage that is already there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this, this idea that there's a very clean split between enterprise, B2B, B2C, the way we've seen it at Canva is that that isn't really true. Like everyone has a home life, everyone has a work life. Um, you might, you know, you're a VC, but you've got a kid in school and people might use Canva in one way and then they turns out they've gone to get a job in marketing at a big corporate. So there's a lot of interaction between those different personas. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of advocacy. So for example, Canva from the beginning has given the a, a, a premium package to not-for-profits. We've got, I think we're on 600,000 registered charities and NFPs now on our dedicated not-for-profit plan. Mm -hmm. So huge global footprint. And of course, 
apart from anything else, they're really, really grateful. They love Canva, um, both for the fact that they love the tool, but the fact that we've given it to them for free, not just as a marketing thing, but as a, as a kind of values thing. Um, and of course, you know, they also go and spread the word about Canva. They say they love Canva. Their husbands and wives might work in the corporate sector. So there's a, you know, we take the bottom-up model very, very seriously. Sort of a, a virtuous cycle of reinforcing exactly. you know, goodness. Um, okay, that's great. Um, so I'm, I'm a VC, which means I have to ask about generative AI. Um, you know, I guess 15 years ago, we saw how cloud really disrupted a lot of the traditional on-prem uh, legacy enterprise software vendors. And uh, you know, a lot of the discussion today around Gen AI, Gen AI or the debate has been, will, um, will Gen AI actually empower many of those legacy you know, companies or will there be some new emergent you know, business that comes out of nowhere that is able to do a you know, design you know, product offering just based on a prompt or based on natural language and really disrupt the category. Um, you know, how do you view the opportunity and the threat of, uh, potential threat of, of generative AI and, What's Canva doing in terms of uh, you know, thinking it through and there, how has it impacted the strategy? So we just see it as a massive opportunity. And um, I mean, in terms of the strategy, we actually see what's going on with AI as being very similar to what happened with design 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. the, if the original pitch deck for Canva basically said design is a fragmented ecosystem, all these different tools and vendors for these different parts of the process, but the user just wants one experience. So what Canva set out to do is to bring all of that together into a single tool and make it really easy to use. And that's exactly how we've approached AI. It's this very, very fragmented ecosystem, lots of different tools for different things. But what the user wants is to just get their job done. And so we have, I think, been very well placed to make AI useful in the day-to-day -day for real people. And um, we've actually been focused on AI for much longer than the recent buzz. Um, we acquired Kaleido, the mm -hmm. visual AI company behind Remove BG, the, the world's best background removal tool on images. That was four years ago. Um, so we've been in AI for a long time, but we've always seen it as just part of what we've always set out to do, which is to use technology to enable people to communicate visually better. Um, that's led most recently to our acquisition of Leonardo, um, mm -hmm. who have a world-class foundational model for image generation. But Again, coming back to the second part of your question, it's certainly very easy to imagine a world where you write a prompt and it produces a presentation for you, and there's lots of tools that do that already. But the real question is, can you, can you make that work in a way that your human creativity is then unlocked, that after it's created, that you and I can collaborate on it with really good real-time collaboration, mm -hmm. that it's, it's a company piece of work, so it needs to be really good enterprise-level security. Um, you then want to be able to publish it into all different doc types, so you want seamless moving between of those. And so all the infrastructure that, that we have in place, we see AI just um, su supercharging, really, mm -hmm. but, the, but the, the importance of that is not going anywhere. Yeah. And I guess it's interesting, so two, you mentioned these two acquisitions. Um, I think you'd also mentioned that Canva's made more than maybe half a dozen acquisitions, uh, many of which were European companies. Um, is that sort of part of the strategy? Is there a reason why you know, so many of them have been European? Or you know, what's the, what's the, how does M&A kind of fit in? And, uh, you know, and, and is there a geographic lens that you know, Canva thinks through when it comes to M&A? So yeah, I think probably of the nine, I think the numbers would be nine, nine acquisitions in total, of which seven have been in Europe. Um, that I don't think has been a, a kind of European growth strategy as such. I think it's partly that Canva as an Australian company has more of a global view, whereas mm -hmm. maybe American companies tend to focus more on the American ecosystem, just in terms of people they've met and people they know and investors in common. Um, but I think the way that, I mean, Canva is a very culture-led company and a very sort of founder mode oriented company. And so I think the way that the acquisitions have worked for Canva, it's always been, is there a great strategic fit? Is there a great product fit? But importantly, is there a very high level of immediate instinctive trust between the Canva founders and, and the acquired founders? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's really the secret source that you're looking for. Because if, if you can find that, then you bring in people to a bigger company that can help keep it in founder mode yeah. um, <clears throat> and who are excited to be there. That's great. I know we're almost out of time. Maybe uh, you know one last quick you know question. I don't know if you can comment on this, but you know you and I we're both based in London, and you had mentioned that uh, you know you've uh, Canva's 
has a large employee base and has acquired some space there. Uh, any plans to you know to you know to do anything exciting with the space or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we see our campuses increasingly as kind of gathering places, convening places. I mean, I came here on Tuesday, but just on the Monday night we hosted a really great event um, around AI and creativity. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I think we're out of time, so I won't talk for too long on this. But we are going to be opening a space soon where we love the startup community to come and be present. We're going to be doing panels, almost like a rolling conference yeah. um, in, in, in Shoreditch where we're based. So That's excited great. to see you and others there. Exciting stuff. Well, thank you, Duncan. And we're going to be at the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the mentoring area for some Q&A in uh, 15, 20 minutes. So uh, if, if folks want to ask more questions of Duncan Clark, thanks very much. Thank you, Alex.